So the session today, which is, sorry, <laughs> I know what it is. It's fatigue and pain and PI. <laughs> and I can relate. <laughs> so I am pleased to announce that our session is being presented by Dr. Jawad Hajar, Dr. Rafi Tachin, and Karen Lowe. So please welcome them to today. Thank you everyone for the invitation and for us to give you a semi-radical new presentation on pain and fatigue and primary immune deficiency. Who here has pain today? Just raise your hand. Okay, that's pretty overwhelming. Who here is fatigued and wishes they had more energy? It's almost more. Who here has both? Okay, I forgot to raise mine. <laughs> so today I will present a little bit about a background on chronic pain and then Following me will be Dr. Jude Hajar, who will talk about fatigue and primary immune deficiency and present some of her data. And following that, Karen Lowe will present insights on cannabis-based medicine in pain. All right, and at the end, if there's time, which it doesn't seem like there will be, I wanted to do a quick session on a hypnotherapy for a patient that might be in pain, but we could discuss that. These are my disclosures. So what is pain? It's actually a dynamic process. It's not like right now your pain is the same as it was two minutes ago before we, I came up here. You probably have less pain or more. Uh, so it's a bunch of transmissions. It's almost like an elevator shaft going from pain to brain and pain, pain to brain and brain to pain. Sometimes we seem to uh, uh, spam out for pain. We're sitting there, like right now I'll say, pardon the expression, your buttocks, when you think about them, might have a one or two out of 10 pain, but it's just not reaching consciousness. And that's, that's a factor as well. So our goal is really to minimize pain and minimize fatigue. This is a simplistic demonstration of how these transmission occurs. And when you have dysregulation or when you cannot interrupt those pathways, if you're in pain, you, you essentially get into this chronic pain mode. How do we measure it? We can use visual analog scores, a zero to 10 facial scores. We look at vital signs to get objective uh, data. We get proxy report, so your loved one, I know some of you here have your caretakers, your uh, family members might say he or she's in pain when you're not being too responsive. Behavioral changes, sometimes your significant other might say, I know he or she's gonna be in pain because I feel the changes in behavior the activities that you're limited from, and self-reports, which will include that factor of fatigue. And so all pain, whether your physician, your nurse, your triage person in the ER believes it or not, all pain is real, and all pain is physical. And pretty much every type of pain is inflammatory. And these are gonna be influenced by your biology, so your makeup, your thoughts, your emotions, and your social cultural context. How is that? Well, there's a physical perception, gender, age, attentional focus, these all matters. So if a patient has attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, they're gonna be a better candidate to overcome their pain because they're hopping from one idea, from one social and one conscious state to another versus someone who's got pervasive development or developmental disorders, right? Someone who's more on the spectrum of uh, Asperger to autism who just perseverates over that pain and cannot un unclench themselves. So these are things that the clinician needs to know and you guys need to know. States of arousal or anxiety can amplify the pain, cognitive level. Uh, in mice we've seen this and in people we've proven it, exposure to other people's pain and that empathy that drives yours up and past pain experiences and what those were related to and the consequences. So cultural norms, in some cultures, it might be boys that are more sensitive than girls. In other cultures, it's girls that are more sensitive than boys to pain. Expectations, if you're meant to be playing on the team and you're in pain or, you're, or you need to show up to work and you're in pain, that's a different context versus 
No one's going to have a consequence if I show up to work or sports or, or, or not. The perception of control is huge. You want to control the pain, not have it control you. And the relevance as well as your coping ability and style, which are things that you can work on. As far as assessing these, uh, uh, in a clinic we take a good pain history, look at the physical symptoms, function, both physical and social, and also extend out to academic and work and family function. And we also look at your emotional, cognitive state, your coping style, the stressors that are driving pain up or down, major life events that might have influenced or predisposed you to the next onslaught of pain, and the consequences. So essentially, rather than deal with it as for you it's psychological pain, for you it's bone pain, for you it might be just uh, emotional, you know, relating to a, a child's pain, it's actually biopsychosocial. So if you don't take that approach, you won't have much success. I will quickly delve into this because I want to allow my, my peers to uh, give their talk. So when we look at what affects the pain, other than emotional and cognitive, it's depression, anxiety, stress, suggestibility, the hypnotic, hypnotic state, meditation can help relieve it, relaxation, and therapies such as music therapy. Uh, lastly, education for the patient, breathing and putting things into context or getting into a cadence of breathing. Uh, psychotherapy will help, school interventions, physical therapy, occupational obviously will help, and complementary and alternative medicine techniques and, and therapies. And some of these are listed here. And I shamelessly will plug the uh, music therapy program that I uh, uh, started, which is Children's Music Fund, which is one type of therapy. And so thank you, and we will continue this with Dr. Hajar at this point to come up and discuss fatigue and her research in primary immune deficiency. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to take a moment and thank the IDF organizers for having me this morning. It's quite a pleasure. This is actually my first meeting here, and it's really been wonderful so far. So I'm really excited that I was invited to talk to you about fatigue and primary immunodeficiency. This is a project that I've been working on for a few years now, and I'm glad that I'm going to have the opportunity to share some of our findings with you today. Um, I do not have any conflict of interest, but I do want to acknowledge that the IDF actually supported and funded part of the research that I'm going to share with you. And a lot of data that I'm going to be showing today are actually your data. So thank you so much for contributing to this. So uh, I started my career at Baylor a few years ago as a clinical immunologist, and I was uh, starting to amass this cohort of patients who are mainly adolescents and young adults and adult patients with PID. And I was young and I just finished fellowship and I wanted to make sure those patients have the right dose of their immunoglobulins and they are on the right antibiotics and asking them all those questions. But there was a question that kept coming up no matter how much I tried to fight it out. The patients always tell me that they are feeling tired. And it's not that they are tired like, oh, I had a bad night of sleep or I need a nap. It was tired that a mom will tell me I am not able to get out of bed, get my kids ready for school, or a man is telling me I need to be on disability because I really cannot go to work. And I was like, this is really serious. So I remember going to my mentor, Jordan Orange, at the time, and I was like, I want to do a research study when I understand the mechanisms of fatigue and how to treat it in PID. And he goes like, mm, do you think that fatigue is a problem? And I said, yeah, all my patients say that. And he was like, prove it. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, in order for anybody to pay attention to anything that you're going to say and request research funding, you have to show that there is actually a problem. And in the literature, there was barely nothing about fatigue in PID. There is a lot of data on cancer-related fatigue, but almost nothing about PID. There was one uh, survey that was done. It was the very first survey done by the IDF that asked the patient something about the wear of effect of immunoglobulins, and some patients said that they felt it as fatigue, and that was almost it. So we were like, we have to show a signal. Nobody is even believing that fatigue is a problem in immune deficiency. So what we did is actually 
we turned our attention to the US, U.S. Immunodeficiency Network. You are probably familiar with this database. It's a database that is fed by doctors and healthcare providers who take care of PID patients, and they enter their information in that database. On the intake form, there is one question that asks the doctors whether they think their patients are fatigued or not. So we queried USIDNet, they allowed us to obtain the data, and we looked at it, and this is what we found. So if you query 100 healthy people in the U.S. or the U.K., you'll find about 6 to 7 percent that they are fatigued. So out of 100, 6 or 7. But taking all PID patients, and this is a database of over 1,000 different patients of PID, almost all of them are above that block line that you're seeing. That is actually the, what is considered, this is a 6.5. But interestingly, when you look, CVID stood out as a separate diagnosis with about 30% of the times, the doctors thought that the patients with CVID have fatigue. We tried to look a little bit closely about who are those patients, and we found that CVID patients that were thought by their doctors to be fatigued were the sicker CVID, the ones who had the non-infectious complications, the ones who had the lung disease, the gut disease, the enlarged lymph nodes, and we had access to some immune information about those patients, and when we did, we were able to show, and people who um, know a little bit about CVID know that the immune cell numbers are usually normal. So everybody was normal, but the ones who had fatigue had the lower end of normal of their immune cells compared to the ones who did not have fatigue according to their doctors. So we thought maybe this is a good start, but then the problem is, the so what question. So um, I work in Baylor, we are in academia, you have to show that the problem matters and if you can fix it, then you can actually make a difference in the outcome. Otherwise, it's not worthy of funding, it's not worthy of studying, it's not worthy of your time. So for a lot of physicians, including myself for a long time, some of the quality of life issues are considered part of the disease. It's part of the package and we just expect that we're gonna have to live with it, endure it, and it, because there's nothing to treat. But actually, the Italian group, Isabella Quinti and its group in Italy, have shown in a cohort of CVID of over 100 patients that they studied at baseline and then followed them one year later and then eight years later. They looked at their quality of life at the beginning, one year later, and at the end of eight years. This cohort had some people who unfortunately died because of their CVID at the end of eight years. So what they did is that they looked back at their answers to their quality of life questions at, days, at year zero, one year, and then whenever it was available before their death. And they found out that actually the patients who at the beginning of the study had the worst quality of life actually were the one who did not make it at the end of years. So there is something that the patients knew they were not feeling good, their quality of life was impaired. They predicted that they had a worse disease. Those are the bad news. The good news are, so on this paper, Dr. Taboli is an excellent biostatistician. He modeled mathematically a way that he was able to say, if we could improve the quality of life of CVID patients by one point, and the way that the question was, you ask things about their physical, uh, quality of life and their social quality of life. So, so physical quality of life, I could go and pick up my kids from school. Social is, I am not going to go to this concert that I really love because I'm just terribly tired. So if you could improve either one of those two, the physical or the social, you could actually decrease the risk of death by two to three percent. This is not trivial. So this was a very important study for us to build on it. So we went in and uh, looked at the Immune Deficiency Foundation survey in 2013. And Dr. Nick Ryder, who is one of my colleagues and friends at Baylor, was looking at the quality of life of the survey. Those are probably your answers. We actually teased out some questions that were asked about fatigue in their survey. They were just buried in it. And we found out that taking everything aside, if you take CV ideas who feel that they are fatigued versus not, then fatigue is a direct implicator on quality of life. In other words, if somebody has fatigue, their quality of life impaired is impaired regardless of their age, sex, what immunoglobulins they are on, or their comorbidities. So fatigue directly relates to quality of life. 
So that is very important. Now we're going to have to show again how fatigue is important when you ask the right questions. So we went to the same survey and we teased out all the fatigue information together and we wanted to know more who are those fatigued patients. So this is a study that only looked at adults with CVID and uh, there were a little bit over 1,000, but we had to clean out some of the data. If there are some answers that are not complete, we had to throw it out. So we had a little bit over 900 patients. And I just want to point out here to make sure that the message goes correctly. The fatigue in this specific survey was asked, do you feel fatigue slash wear of effect? So it was kind of guiding patients and to, limp, uh, to lump the fatigue and the wear of effect together. And they were asking, have you ever felt fatigue, wear of effect? And then they ask questions about when do you feel it? And of course we have data about what immunoglobulins they're on, uh, what doses, how they get it, how frequently. So we were able to clean out the data and show, again, this is fatigue slash wear of effect. In this specific survey, the patients who were on IVIG had more fatigue compared to the ones who are on sub-Q. And when you want to time the fatigue according to their infusion cycle, the majority had this kind of chronological uh, distribution. So the majority of the patient, and I don't think this is a pointer, uh, but the very first column from your right is, are the patients who infuse every four weeks or more, which is the majority. They start feeling the fatigue towards week three to four. So that means, but if you are infusing every three weeks, then you start feeling the fatigue at week two. So it kind of, it is the wear off effect. And in this survey, uh, almost about 75% of the patients felt fatigue. So this is way different from the first survey, but there are data to show that we as doctors do not do a good job in recognizing patient reported symptoms. So there have been studies in cancer that say that uh, the patient's symptoms, especially in fatigue, are actually more accurate than what the doctors think because not, doctors do not always kind of appreciate the fatigue symptoms. So it was not surprising for us that in this data we actually found the prevalence of fatigue to be more than three out of four patients with CVID. So the IDF were, was very generous with us. They provided us funding and allow us to insert questions that are specific to fatigue in the last survey in 2018. So for the people who participated, you might have seen some questions about whether you can do certain things at certain times. And uh, those were part of the brief fatigue inventory. And we inserted a couple of questions about depression and we've inserted a couple of questions as well about other variables They were in that study. And what we found out that when you ask specific questions about fatigue and you do not link it to wear of effect, then IVIG versus sub-Q did not matter anymore. And that's why I want to make sure that everybody gets this message. The fatigue that happens as a wear of effect is more common in IVIG, but the fatigue in general is not related to IVIG versus sub-QIG. And there are some patients that actually feel tired at the beginning of the infusion then feel excellent, and there are some people who feel excellent at the beginning and they worsen at the end. So we couldn't say that it's across the board IVIG, you could blame it for fatigue, but the, you know, it's depend on the context, so every patient is going to be a little bit different. But again and again, we were able to show that the fatigued CVIPD patients were the sicker. They were the ones who had the non-infectious complications, the inflammation. And we were able to show as well that they are experiencing disability because of that. And this was very important to put, to kind of show that those patients report more disability, they were working less, they had lower income in their household compared to the ones who did not have fatigue. And I could not put all those figures together, but this figure is probably the most telling and this was presented in the Clinical Immunology Society just in the past few months because we really wanted uh, providers to appreciate that this is a problem that is affecting the patients on multiple levels. So what did that we find so far? Fatigue is a true problem in CVID. It does affect quality of life. I didn't show you the slide, but our reviewers in the first paper wanted to show that it, only, it does not only affect adults, but it does affect pediatrics, so we did analyze the data, and it actually, as young as six years old and above, you can show that even children experience fatigue because of CVID. 
Fatigue, if it is a wear-off effect, is, is more common in IVIG patients, but if you take the wear-off effect out of the equation, then you cannot blame the IVIG on it anymore. Uh, fatigue is higher in the patients who have non-infectious complications, and it does affect quality of life. So this is our hypothesis. Fatigue is like the tip of the iceberg, and it could be that it's just a clinical sign of something really bad going on. Just like those canaries in a, a coal mine, when they, the, the miners used to bring them into the coal mine, and if they stop singing, that they know that there is a gas leak. It could be that the fatigue is that indication that there is something going wrong in the body of the CVID. And it could be it's because there are some non-infectious complications that are developing and could be the early sign. So we have to pay attention to it because it's going to lead us to understand that those patients might be sicker and we have to do something to identify those non-infectious complications. So our current work actually aims to understand the mechanisms of fatigue and CVID. And we are focusing on the concept of the gut-brain axis. So there are a lot of data on other mental illnesses and chronic fatigue syndrome that says the, the composition of the microbes in the gut causes and sends signals to the brain. And just like uh, Rafi has mentioned earlier, it's a, a whole body unit thing. So uh, there are a lot of data that maybe support that there, the inflammation is starting from the gut, and maybe it's that link between the gut and the brain. So. We think that the composition of the microbes in the gut of CVID patient is not like the normal people. And it's actually, there are some bad microbes that are driving the inflammation that goes to the blood, crosses to the brain, and causes people to feel fatigue. And we have an ongoing clinical trial. It's non-interventional. Unfortunately, at this time, we cannot offer treatment for fatigue because we really need to understand the cause of it to be able to kind of provide therapeutics. So this is a non-interventional study, but we are actually recruiting patients primarily, if possible, with CVID or an IVIG specifically. They have to be adults, and they have to be off antibiotics for at least 30 days, and we are collecting blood and stool samples from them, and we're doing the analysis to see if we can show that fatigue is actually correlating to the inflammation. So. Uh, those are the informations about the study. I have a, a research assistant who is happy to talk to people who are interested in the study. And uh, I hope in the future I can report to you the results of the study and other studies, hopefully as intervention to treat fatigue and CVID. And with that, I would like to thank my uh, current mentor, Dr. George and Orange, my previous mentor, um, all uh, the, my collaborators, including the ones at MD Anderson, our funding, uh, is, as well as the Immune Deficiency Foundation, who really supported a good part of this project, and the patients and their families. Without them, we really could not have done any of this work. And for you all for answering the IDF surveys, those are critical for us to provide data that are easily accessible and allow us to build on information. So thank you all. Good morning, everybody. I'm Karin. I'm a nurse practitioner from Los Angeles, and I'll be presenting on the insights into cannabis-based medicine in the treatment for pain. Um, so we'll just go to the next slide, please. For disclo Oh, sorry. Okay, disclaimers and disclosures. I don't really have any conflicts of interest, but what I do want to point out today is in the discussions and questions, I cannot make any treatment recommendations or dosing recommendations for any patients here, but I can help answer some of the questions about biology. Uh, objectives for today will be describing the incidence of pain in patients with PI, describing types of pain, which Dr. Tajjan already covered, describing something called the endocannabinoid system and the components of that. We'll also be identifying cannabis-based medicine for pain and the research already known, um, common delivery systems that are out there, as well as side effects, and then we'll review some of the current ongoing research. So first and foremost, pain and PI, what do we know? 
Well, we know that pain does affect quality of life, usually negatively. Anybody here who's had pain ever before will attest to that. Very little is known about pain in PI, unfortunately, because if you've attended this conference today, you do know that there are 350 plus disorders that fall into the PI umbrella. So to answer some of the questions, the IDF conducted a survey in 2017, and one of the questions that was asked is, is the patient currently taking a prescribed pain medication like oxycodone, codeine, um, and various other ones? So these were some of the results. As you can see, we had a huge spread of patients completing this survey. Pretty much every disorder in the PI community is captured here. But when we go back and look here, for adult patients over the age of 18, you can see that patients between 35 and 64 were the biggest users of prescribed pain medications. That's actually surprising because we don't fully understand why people are having pain. So this led us to ask some additional questions, but first we have to evaluate the types of pain. So as Dr. Tajjan talked about earlier, there are different types of pain. There are three classes that I'm gonna talk about today. Neuropathic pain is nerve injury. That can be from trauma, that can be from surgery. Nociceptive pain is a fancy word for if you think about a noxious stimuli or injury, typically to tissues and to organs. And then there's also mixed type. Mixed type can, consists of nociceptive and neuropathic. Each of these categories has different medicine that actually treats it. For neuropathic, you have neuropathic pain medications. For nociceptive, you can be treated with acetaminophen with opioids. For mixed types, it's usually mixed types. Cannabis-based medicine is one of those emerging therapies that currently is being uh, mentioned as a potential treatment for these types of pain. So with that said, great, well, what is cannabis-based medicine? How does it work? So to answer that question, we have to look at what the endocannabinoid system is. So it's a system of receptors molecules and enzymes that was actually discovered in the 1990s, and it's aptly named after the plant that led to the discovery, cannabis. These, the receptors or the system, the ECS, actually functions to maintain balance in the body. And it regulates processes such as metabolism, immune function, inflammation, and pain perception. So the receptors, there are only two that I'm gonna talk about today, there are many more, but these are the two most researched receptors. So I wanna take a look first at these green circles. These are CB1 receptors, first discovered. They're mostly found in the brain and in the nervous system, so that means top of my head to the bottom of my feet, anywhere where I feel, that's where these guys are. The distribution varies from how young you are to how old you are. The younger, the more you have in your brain. The older, the less you have, but they don't go away. And they're also found in the immune system in various cells, and also in organs, lungs, liver, bones, muscles. So then we go to the purple, which are CB2. CB2 receptors are not necessarily found in the brain. Some of them are, but most of them are actually found in the periphery. So these guys are found, again, in immune cells, in the spleen, lungs, bone marrow, muscles, and organs. Before I move on, I just wanna make sure these circles that you see on these diagrams, that's not actually just where these receptors are. In truth, the receptors are everywhere. They're in every tissue, they're on every cell. But this is a good description just to give you an idea. CB1, brain, CB2, outside. So great, so we have these receptors. What does that mean? So in our bodies, we actually make something called endocannabinoids. These are molecules that go in and stimulate the receptors. So the first one is AEA, the second one is 2AG. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce this in front of you guys today. Um, these in our body, they actually don't exist constantly. They're only produced when they're needed, which is important. Then we have synthetic cannabinoids. 
If you've ever taken anything like, or heard of anything like, dronabinol, nabilone, these are things that are synthesized in laboratories. And then, these are the two hot ones right now, the phytocannabinoids. These come from plants, THC, CBD. And have any of you guys done any research, looked into the use of this stuff? Okay, a few. Okay, <laughs> so how do these work? So there is some research actually that exists internationally and good research, not anecdotal reports, about CBD being, or CBM, I'm sorry, being used for pain. Um, cannabinoids actually have been demonstrated to reduce the various types of pain by a few different mechanisms. It can decrease the inflammatory response. So if you remember, when Dr. Tajdin was presenting where the pain feedback is from the brain to the pain, from the pain to the brain, remember where those receptors are. CB1, CB2, they're everywhere. So pain response is usually treated and affected by CBM. CB2 activation specifically has anti-inflammatory effects, which is opening the door for CB2-targeted therapies in development, in research, not in the US. Cannabinoids also can change how pain is processed. So if you come back again to CB1 receptors, they're in the brain. Um, it can, if you're giving a, a cannabis-based medicine that does target that, it can decrease the detection of a painful stimulus. It can decrease the sensitivity to pain. It can decrease the response of pain receptors. So it's instead of if I stub my toe and jump up and down, now if I dose with something and I stub my toe, I might just say, oh, that hurt. So my response is not as severe. And then as a result, some of the things that we're seeing in animal models is with the use of CBM, less opioids are sometimes needed for pain, which is a good thing. So these are the four current FDA-approved CBM therapies, not for pain. I just wanted to put these up here because this is important to see. The first two products were first approved in 1985. The third one, 2016, and the most recent one, 2018. The first three are for chemo-induced nausea vomiting, anorexia in AIDS, and then the, the bottom one is actually for a seizure disorder, or excuse me, seizure disorder that was just approved in June of last year. This is unfortunately the only products we have. But that doesn't mean we don't have things. So um, as you know, there are dispensaries. Legalization in the US of commercially provided products is actually expanding. That is actually a piece of a problem for us because we have all of these different preparations available that people are purchasing. You can smoke the product, you can vape it, you can put a suppository, oil, edibles, tinctures. The effect of the therapy depends on the, the actual method of administration. THC and CBD both bind to CB1 and CB2 receptors together. So it's not, THC does not just exclusively bind to CB1. But CBD does not cause those intoxicating effects that you'll see with THC which is important. The products are not feder federally regulated. What does that mean? Well, the guidelines state to state vary. Um, we don't actually have federal approval for this. But in this state, you will, you will have many, many laws about regulations. In Colorado, for example, your label, your purity has to be proven. In other states, it doesn't. So we get to labeling issues. The labels are not regulated. We don't have to put a lot of information on there. The same goes with product purity. What is produced and sold to you at a dispensary or on Amazon doesn't necessarily have to be what it says. So those are some concerns that we keep in mind. The additional component here is strain inconsistency. When I last checked, there are almost 3,000 strains in the US alone. That's a lot. What that means, if you go to a dispensary, you purchase something, let's call it Purple Dragon, and it works. And then in a month, you want to go buy Purple Dragon again. 
Well, it's not necessarily going to be the exact same strain that you purchased the first time because it depends on where it comes from. Hopefully, it's actually regulated by the store, but that's where the federal and state legislation is an issue. THC CBD are not without side effects. It's a common misconception that these products are safe, and that's from a lot of anecdotal evidence. Unfortunately, there is evidence that it can actually increase anxiety. THC, especially with some of the newer strains that we're seeing, hyperemesis syndrome where patients are being admitted to the hospital, need a lot of treatment. Psychosis is another one, and use disorder and abuse, especially with THC. CBD can also cause anxiety, changes in mood, changes in appetite, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. The important thing to also remember, yes, it does matter how much you're taking, how consistently people are taking it, because these side effects sometimes are dose dependent. Now this is the biggest concern, particularly for me with PI patients. Drug-drug interactions and concerns are huge. Cannabis products are heavily metabolized through the liver. If you're a PI patient who's on medications, let's say antibiotics, because you are at risk for infection, that can be a potential issue because both CBD and THC can change the metabolism of those drugs. It can either decrease the level or increase the level. In some cases, it can be toxic, it can be fatal. One example, THC, Warfarin. If anybody's ever been on a blood thinner and they start taking THC, it can actually cause some problems with that level. It also becomes a problem if you're inconsistently using any of these products and consistently using your regular medications because now everything is fluctuating. So these are things that we have to look for. So CBD theoretically is known to or is suspected to do this. It's not been proven. And the thing is, there are so many medications that we can't really address every single thing yet. Current research in the US, well, we don't really have a lot, but as awareness to the therapeutic potential of cannabis-based medicine is in expanding, research initiatives are accelerating and questions by clinicians are being asked. We're hoping that research may actually reveal new applications and provide clarity around dosing as well, because that is something, if you've ever Googled or visited a dispensary, dosing is kind of, nobody really has a guideline for you. And then as of June 5th, I actually went and I looked, well, how many active studies do we currently have in the US using cannabis-based medicine for anything? So for THC, 15 studies, currently are using or is for um, evaluating THC for certain conditions. Only five of them are focusing on pain. CBD, 14 clinical trials exist, only one focused on pain. And I created this little table. I can put this up at the end for anybody who's interested. These are the THC studies in the US right now. You'll see only five interventional, two are observational. They are currently recruiting. There are some strict inclusion-exclusion criteria, which if people are interested, I would refer them to these centers. The second one is CBD. So only one active study. However, there is one study that is currently preparing to actually open. And I see people are taking photos, okay. Finally, so what does all of this mean? Oh, and I meant photos, that's okay. I just wanna make sure I don't advance too fast. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for you? We know that patients with PI are having pain, but we don't fully understand what types of pain and how many people are actually having pain. So that's something that we need help from the PI patients to help us answer those questions and understand your pain. Second, we have to really do a better job of doing more research into the application of CBM in pain. And then finally, organizations like IDF, NIH, private institutions, academic institutions, we need to collaborate with the patients, the clinicians, and the organizations to really do research about how can we potentially apply CBM 
in PI and also help improve your quality of life because at the end of the day, that is what we're trying to do. Okay, any questions? Oh, and references if anybody is interested. Okay, so two of the questions that I did receive are pretty similar. The first one is CBD oil effective if just used topically at the pain site? And the second one, how do I feel about the use of CBD oil? Um, let me address the first one. Okay, so CBD oil topically. I can tell you from the pharmacokinetic studies that we've reviewed, and that have been done actually internationally. There's been large studies done with this to assess if I put it on where it hurts versus if I take it by mouth or if I inhale it, how does it work? The topical applications for ointments, patches, isn't really been proven that it actually will help patients. Oral products with, keep in mind with um, that metabolism by the liver, oral products actually stay in the system a lot longer, but, if I were to take a product, and let's say Dr. Tajdin takes a product, how it affects me is going to be different from him. And we don't fully understand that yet, so oral might not even work. Inhaled products, could, because cannabis, CBD can actually be smoked as well, that one is typically um, the absorption and presence in the blood to actually have these anti-inflammatory effects or anti-pain effects it is actually present a lot faster, within an hour or less, but it doesn't last long. So for some people, topical maybe works, but from the research that I've seen, it does not really have a great deal of effect. Uh, okay, so the second question was, how do I feel about CBD oil for pain relief uh, with it, except when extremely fatigued? So CBD and CBD and THC, like I said, both of them bind the CB1, CB2 receptor, not completely, just partially. Both of these products actually work for pain. The, the big difference is CBD does not have that intoxicating effect that THC does. The other piece, too, is if you take CBD, or if you take THC, you get the intoxicating effect. CBD actually decreases the intoxicating effect if you take it with, or if, not you, but if people were to take it with THC. CBD doesn't, as far as I know, doesn't induce that fatigue that people will see with THC. And, and so is there a difference in the ability to decrease inflammation between THC and CBD? Not really. THC, like I said, it, it, both of them bind to both receptors. THC has a higher affinity, so it likes CB1 receptors more but it does bind to both receptors. So if patients or um, study subjects are interested, that's usually something if they don't want to do the intoxicating product, there is CBD that can be used because it doesn't have the intoxicating effect, but it does still actually treat the uh, inflammation and help with that inflammatory response and the pain feedback. Any other questions? Okay. All three, let's, let's come up here. There are a few other questions we're going to rifle through since you guys are you know, giving us a stack of questions. We didn't come here to answer stuff. <laughs> this one's interesting. How can I blame my pain on PI when I'm 70 years old and would normally expect more pain at this age? Valid statement, but here's the invalidity that we present up here. We're not doing a great job. Once we do that, if you feel like that pain is relieved, then you can blame it on your age. Make sense? So uh, that remains to be uh, discovered. What is the basis of pain occurrence in PI, the type of pain due to PI causes? Well, you know that with PI, you're also getting end organ damage. As you saw up there, uh, Dr. Hajar's slides about lung, kidney, GI system. So all those are visceral pains that Karin also explained. 
that are giving you that noxious stimulus to, to drive up to that final penthouse where you're sitting going, oh man, this is a bad FedEx package of, you have pain, you have pain. Does that make sense? Uh, what is the effort on fatigue and pain of compensatory elevations of alpha interferon for antibody deficiency? Good question. Well, we know that the interferons, especially alpha and gamma, help with your, some of your PI diagnoses. For instance, alpha interferon has been injected into molluscum contagiosum and seen relief. So that's decreasing inflammation in areas where we don't completely understand the biology. And uh, it, it, again, more science needed to figure out what these levels are and some of these uh, scientific questions that we're asking to see if we can do those in clinical trials so that it's scientific and not just a one-off, oh, mine worked and mine didn't, or someone else's didn't. Have you found benefits to acupuncture to improve pain, fatigue in patients with PI? Did you guys not watch my part of the presentation? I'm kidding. Acupuncture helps, but it, again, it depends on the patient and the type of pain. For functional abdominal pain and headaches, it works beautifully, especially myofascial pains. All right, so it's, at this stage, we're still in trial and error. You know, you try acupuncture, you try massage therapy, and you try Reiki. It may or may not work. We need to get to, and again, this is our uh, downfall. We need to get to the point where it's prescription, it's precision medicine. I can predict that you are going to do great with acupuncture and your sister is going to do actually better with art therapy. All right? Uh, Jude, how about you with some questions? Well, thank you for the question. Tough crowd, I have to say. So, um, first, I did get an important comment about the study and the reasoning behind uh, excluding uh, patients who are on antibiotics for 30 days, despite the fact that prophylactic antibiotics might improve um, fatigue. I totally agree. The reason we exclude patients is because we are specifically looking at the microbes in the gut, and if somebody is on antibiotics for any reason, then the, the, the antibiotics affect the microbes in the gut for everybody. So our first run, it has to be as homogeneous population as possible to prove a signal, but we do have an extended study that if this study goes well, we're going to allow patients on prophylactic antibiotics because it is a good part of our patients with CBID, but for now we're trying to detect the signal in as a much homogeneous population as possible. A question about does... Um, uh, increasing the dose of uh, immunoglobulin um, improves symptoms, and that's a very, very good question. And some of the data that I did not show actually uh, do look at dosing, frequency, differences between IVIG and immunoglobulin. We've done the analysis in multiple ways, but we could not prove that if you increase the dose that your fatigue is better or worse uh, in either sub-Q or IVIG. The same thing with the frequency. If you give it every four weeks, is it more fatigue than if you give it every three weeks? So more research needs to be done, and part of our uh, perspective study that I showed at the end is going to try to answer this question. Uh, there is a question about treatments that have had good results. The only thing that is published with good evidence and is not in PID but in cancer is exercise and sunlight exposure. And this is what I tell my patient. It, it's actually for free and with no side effects and it's actually are the treatments that has been proven, and it might sound like uh, counterintuitive to exercise when you're feeling tired, but it actually does overcome the fatigue if it's done uh, on a regular basis, and it doesn't have to be much exercise at the beginning. It could be slow and you go, but you build that stamina, and it's been shown to be effective in cancer-related fatigue. There is a question that um, asks about uh, inborn errors of metabolism. This is a little bit outside my field of expertise, but I can just generally answer that Baylor Genetics does have a very strong program that lo looks at genetic evaluation of metabolic disorders. So for that person who's interested, I would recommend they go to Baylor Genetics and look at the resources available. Um, there is a question about chronic parvovirus uh, 
in CVID and chronic muscle pain and fatigue. Unfortunately, I don't have any data to say. I know that there may be some case reports and anecdotal reports about persistent parvo in CVID, but I don't have any information about its link with fatigue. Um, so I apologize, but if we have any data, I'll make sure that I provide those information to the IDF group. I think we're out of time for a hypnotherapy session, but if someone's interested, I'm happy to, I don't want to take you away from lunch, to just come up here and do one with a small little circle of people. Fair? So thank you all. Thank you for coming, and I'd like to thank all our presenters. <laughs>